A Commentary from St. Thomas Aquinas on the Gospel According to St. John. Chapter 1, Verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John the Evangelist, as already indicated, makes it his principal object to show the divinity of the incarnate Word. Accordingly, his gospel is divided into two parts. In the first, he states the divinity of Christ. In the second, he shows it by the things Christ did in the flesh. In regard to the first, he does two things. First, he shows the divinity of Christ. Secondly, he sets forth the manner in which Christ's divinity is made known to us. Concerning the first, he does two things. First, he treats of the divinity of Christ. Secondly, of the incarnation of the word of God. Because there are two items to be considered in each thing, namely its existence and its operation or power, first he treats the existence of the word as to his divine nature, secondly of his power or operation. In regard to the first, he does four things. First, he shows when the word was, in the beginning was the word, secondly where he was, and the word was with God. Thirdly, what he was, and the word was God. Fourthly, in what way he was, he was in the beginning with God. The first two pertain to the inquiry whether something exists. The second two pertain to the inquiry what something is. With respect to the first of these four, we must examine the meaning of the statement, in the beginning was the word. And here three things present themselves for careful study according to the three parts of this statement. First, it is necessary to investigate the name word. Secondly, the phrase in the beginning. Thirdly, the meaning of the word was in the beginning. To understand the name word, we should note that according to the philosopher, vocal sounds are signs of the affections that exist in our soul. It is customary in scripture for the things signified to be themselves called by the names of their signs, as in the statement, and the rock was Christ. It is fitting that what is within our soul, and which is signified by our external word, be called a word. But whether the name word belongs first to the exterior vocal sound or to the conception in our mind is not our concern at present. However, it is obvious that what is signified by the vocal sound as existing interiorly in the soul exists prior to the vocal expression inasmuch as it is its actual cause. Therefore, if we wish to grasp the meaning of the interior word, we must first look at the meaning of that which is exteriorly expressed in words. Now, there are three things in our intellect. The intellectual power itself, the species of the thing understood, and this species is its form, being to the intellect what the species of a color is to the eye. And thirdly, the very activity of the intellect, which is to understand. But none of these is what is signified by the exterior vocal word. For the name stone does not signify the substance of the intellect, because this is not what the one naming intends. Nor does it signify the species, which is that by which the intellect understands. Since this also is not the intention of the one naming, nor does it signify the act itself of understanding, since to understand is not an action proceeding to the exterior from the one understanding, but an action remaining within. Therefore, that is properly called an interior word which the one understanding forms when understanding. Now, the intellect forms two things, according to its two operations according to its operations, which is called the understanding of indivisibles, it forms a definition, while according to its operation by which it unifies and separates, it forms an enunciation or something of that sort. Hence, what is thus formed and expressed by the operation of the intellect, whether by defining or enunciating, is what the exterior vocal sound signifies. So the philosopher says that the notion, ratio, which a name signifies, is a definition. Hence, what is thus expressed, that is to say, formed in the soul, is called an interior word. Consequently, it is compared to the intellect, not as that by which the intellect understands, but as that in which it understands. 
because it is in what is thus expressed and formed that it sees the nature of the thing understood. Thus we have the meaning of the name word. Secondly, from what has been said, we are able to understand that a word is always something that proceeds from an intellect existing in act. And furthermore, that a word is always a notion, ratio, and likeness of the thing understood. So if the one understanding and the thing understood are the same, then the word is a notion and likeness of the intellect from which it proceeds. On the other hand, if the one understanding is other than the thing understood, then the word is not a likeness and a notion of the one understanding, but of the thing understood. As the conception which one has of a stone is a likeness of only the stone. But when the intellect understands itself, its word is a likeness and notion of the intellect. And so Augustine sees a likeness of the Trinity in the soul in so far as the mind understands itself, but not in so far as it understands other things. It is clear then that it is necessary to have a word in any intellectual nature, for it is of the very nature of understanding that the intellect in understanding should form something. Now, what is formed is called a word, and so it follows that in every being which understands, there must be a word. However, intellectual natures are of three kinds, human, angelic, and divine. And so there are three kinds of words. The human word, about which it is said in the psalm, the fool said in his heart, there is no God. The angelic word, about which it is said in Zechariah, and in many places in sacred scripture, and the angel said to me. The third is the divine word, of which Genesis says, and God said, let there be light. So when the evangelist says, in the beginning was the word, we cannot understand this as a human or angelic word, because both these words have been made since man and angel have a cause and a principle of their existence and operation, and the word of a man or an angel cannot exist before they do. The word the evangelist had in mind he shows by saying that this word was not made, since all things were made by it. Therefore, the word about which John speaks here is the word of God. We should note that this word differs from our own word in three ways. The first difference, according to Augustine, is that our word is formable before being formed. For when I wish to conceive the notion of a stone, I must arrive at it by reasoning. And so it is in all other things that are understood by us, with the sole possible exception of the first principles which, since they are known in a simple manner, are known at once without any discourse of reason. So as long as the intellect, in so reasoning, casts about this way and that, the formation is not yet complete. It is only when it has conceived the notion of the thing perfectly that for the first time it has the notion of the complete thing and a word. Thus, in our mind, there is both a cogitation, meaning the discourse involved in investigation, and a word, which is formed according to a perfect contemplation of the truth. So our word is first in potency before it is in act. But the word of God is always in act. In consequence, the term cogitation does not properly speaking apply to the word of God. For Augustine says, The word of God is spoken of in such a way that cogitation is not included, lest anything changeable be supposed in God. Anselm was speaking improperly when he said, For the supreme spirit to speak is for him to look at something while cogitating. The second difference is that our word is imperfect, but the divine word is most perfect. For, since we cannot express all our conceptions in one word, we must form many imperfect words through which we separately express all that is in our knowledge. But it is not that way with God. For since he understands both himself and everything else through his essence by one act, the single divine word is expressive of all that is in God, not only of the persons, but also of creatures. Otherwise, it would be imperfect. So Augustine says, If there were less in the word than is contained in the knowledge of the one speaking it, the word would be imperfect. 
but it is obvious that it is more perfect. Therefore, it is only one. God speaks once. The third difference is that our word is not of the same nature as we, but the divine word is of the same nature as God, and therefore it is something that subsists in the divine nature. For the understood notion which the intellect is seen to form about something has only an intelligible existence in our soul. Now in our soul, to understand is not the same as the nature of the soul, because our soul is not its own operation. Consequently, the word which our intellect forms is not of the essence of our soul, but is an accident of it. But in God, to understand and to be are the same. And so the word of the divine intellect is not an accident, but belongs to its nature. Thus, it must be subsistent, because whatever is in the nature of God is God. Thus, Damascene says that God is a substantial word and a hypostasis, but our words are concepts in our mind. From the above, it is clear that the word, properly speaking, is always understood as a person in the divinity since it implies only something expressed by the one understanding. Also, that in the divinity, the word is the likeness of that form which it issues, and that it is co-eternal with that from which it issues, since it was not first formable before being formed, but was always in act, and that it is equal to the Father, since it is perfect and expressive of the whole being of the Father and that it is co-essential and consubstantial with the Father, since it is his substance. It is also clear that since in every nature that which issues forth and has a likeness to the nature from which it issues is called the Son, and since this word issues forth in a likeness and identity to the nature from which it issues, it is suitably and appropriately called a Son, and its production is called a generation. So now the first point is clear, the meaning of the term word. So there are four questions on this point, two of them from Chrysostom. The first is, why did John the Evangelist omit the Father and begin at once with the Son, saying in the beginning was the Word? There are two answers to this. One is that the Father was known to everyone in the Old Testament, although not under the aspect of Father but as God. But the Son was not known. And so, in the New Testament, which is concerned with our knowledge of the Word, he begins with the Word, or Son. The other answer is that we are brought to know the Father through the Son. Father, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given to me. And so, wishing to lead the faithful to a knowledge of the Father, the evangelist fittingly began with the Son, at once adding something about the Father when he says, and the word was with God. The second question is also from Chrysostom. Why did he say word and not son, since, as we have said, the word proceeds as son? There are also two answers to this. First, because son means something begotten, and when we hear of the generation of the son, someone might suppose that this generation is the kind he can comprehend, that is, a material and changeable generation. Thus, he did not say son, but word, which signifies an intelligible proceeding so that it would not be understood as a material and changeable generation. And so in showing that the son is born of the father in an unchangeable way, he eliminates a faulty conjecture by using the name word. The second answer is this. The evangelist was about to consider the word as having come to manifest the Father. But since the idea of manifesting is implied better in the name Word than in the name Son, he preferred to use the name Word. The third question is raised by Augustine in his book, 83 Questions, and it is this. In Greek, where we have Word, they have Logos. Now, since Logos signifies in Latin both notion and Word, that is to say, ratio et verbum, Why did the translators render it as word and not notion? Since a notion is something interior just as a word is. I answer that notion, ratio, 
Properly speaking, names a conception of the mind precisely as in the mind, even if through it nothing exterior comes to be. But word signifies a reference to something exterior. And so because the evangelist, when he said logos, intended to signify not only a reference to the Son's existence in the Father, but also the operative power of the Son, by which, through him, all things were made, our predecessors preferred to translate it word, which implies a reference to something exterior, rather than notion, which implies merely a concept of the mind. The fourth question is from Origen, and is this. In many passages, Scripture, when speaking of the Word of God, does not simply call him the Word, but adds of God, saying the Word of God, or of the Lord. The Word of God on high is the foundation of wisdom. His name is the Word of God. Why then did the evangelist, when speaking here of the word of God, not say, in the beginning was the word of God, but said, in the beginning was the word? I answer that although there are many participated truths, there is just one absolute truth, which is truth by its very essence, that is, the divine act of being, essay, and by this truth all words are words. Similarly, there is one absolute wisdom, elevated above all things, that is, the divine wisdom, by participating in which all wise persons are wise. Further, there is one absolute word, and by participating in which all persons having a word are called speakers. Now this is the divine word, which of itself is the word elevated above all words. So in order that the evangelist might signify this supereminence of the divine word, he pointed out this word to us absolutely without addition. And because the Greeks, when they wished to signify something separate and elevated above everything else, did this by affixing the title to the name as the Platonists wishing to signify the separated substances, such as the separated good or the separated man, called them good per se, or man per se. So the evangelist, wishing to signify the separation and elevation of the word above all things, affixed an article to the name Logos, so that if it were stated in Latin, we would say the word. Our reading of the commentary from St. Thomas Aquinas on the Gospel according to St. John will continue with paragraph 34. Thank you for listening. Ave crux, best unica. Hail the cross, our only hope.